Good evening. Uh, welcome to uh, the second part of our series that deals with travel in Halapa. Uh, last week we had uh, the opportunity uh, to address a few issues that relate to kashrut on the road. Next week we will do things a little bit differently by uh, talking about the history of the coffee house and uh, the rabbinic view of such establishments. And uh, we do uh, thank Pesach and we do thank our sponsors, number one. And may the Neshama indeed have an aliyah. We thank uh, you, Pesach, and we thank uh, all parties involved that uh, put together uh, this wonderful Nourishment. spread. Nourishment, we'll call it. We'll call it nourishment. Uh, but today it's Hilchot Shabbos. Actually, whenever a halacha shir is given on Shabbos, I believe it's a must, and I, it actually is a halachic requirement uh, to address one specific issue before anything else. We must begin with something that is simple, it is well known. But I am required to mention it again. The rule is, Pikuach Nefesh Doche Shabbat. If you have a life-threatening situation, you don't hesitate. Even if you have a safek, if you are in doubt, you are not sure. Uh, does such a case require an ambulance? Should I pick up the phone and call Atsala, or perhaps not? You are in doubt, you call. Act the way you do during the week. It's a simple rule, but it's one that's extremely important. And we have to remind it, and we have to mention it. And I have an obligation to begin a shir on Hilchov Shabbos, must begin with it. And I'll tell you why. There's a statement in the Yerushalmi, addressing a, piece, a, a, a case of a pikuach nefesh, a life-threatening scenario. And the Yerushalmi <coughs> addresses if you go ahead and if you violate the Shabbos or not. He states the Yerushalmi, Hazariz, the one who violates it with enthusiasm, he moves it, he doesn't hesitate. He sees someone he doesn't know if there is a need, if, if, if indeed this is a heart attack or not, he's not sure. He is a zariz. He runs and he doesn't ask questions. He is considered a meshubach. We give him shvach. We give him credit for such behavior. Hanishal, if someone is asked, it is meguneh. It's not appropriate. It is shameful if a person is asked. The statement is not so clear. The third one is Hashoel, if someone starts asking Shilas and says, are you sure that we should be violating the Shabbos? Are, are, are you sure? And they pull out the rabbinic thumb and start asking questions. States the Yerushalmi, Hare ze shofech damim. Strong words. It is like spilling blood. There's a well-known story with Rabbi Sral Salanter. He was a young man, and there was a cholera breakout. And he was running around, and it was a Yom Kippur, it was Shabbos. He was running around doing what it was, whatever was necessary. He did not try to do it with a shinui. He did not try to call a Gentile. He himself <coughs> violated Shabbos. And there was an old-time rabbi there. And the old-time rabbi said to him, perhaps you could go ahead and do it in a way that you downgrade it to a rabbinic issue. And Rabbi Sral Salant made the following statement, and he never ever made such statements. You tell me what to do? Do you realize I'm a much greater scholar than you? This is Rabbi Sroll Salant, uh, the father of the Muslim movement, the teacher that talks about ethics and humility, and he goes ahead and he makes a statement that I'm much greater than you, old time rabbi. I should be the one determining what to do and not you. The students months later asked him, what on earth was that all about? You don't behave like that. And he said, if I wouldn't have responded with force, <coughs> the students around me would have hesitated. I had to be confident because it was a pikuach nefesh. He said for pikuach nefesh, you could have gaiva. In other words, you could be haughty to save a Jewish life or to save a human life in essence. So that's what the Yerushalmi tells us. But let's readdress one statement. Hanishal, 
the one who is asked is Megune. It is disgraceful to be asked. What does that mean? So I'll share with you an insight from a great 18th century rabbinic authority, Rabbi David Frankel. Rabbi David Frankel is known to us for two reasons. One, he had a well-known disciple, Rab Moshe. So he's known, Rabbi Frankel is known for his disciple, Rab Moshe. And reason number two is that he studied Yerushalmi. He was an expert in Yerushalmi, which was not the norm for rabbis in that period. And he realized that if he wants to clarify this text and bring it to the attention of the nation of Israel for the Eida, if he wants to bring it close to the Eida, he has to write a Pirush, a commentary. So he wrote a commentary on the Yerushalmi called Korban HaEida, bringing it close to the Eida, a magnificent Pirush on the Yerushalmi. So now, I will read to you what Rabbi David Frankel how Reb David Frankel explains Hanishal Megune. Zok Reb David Frankel, if a rabbi is asked, if there's a situation, and someone, Lo Aleinu, collapses in shul, and someone walks over to the rabbi and they ask him, Rabbi, is it okay to call an ambulance? Such a rabbi is Megune. Because Hayalo Lidrosh Dvarim Elu Berabim. This is not an issue that is taught <coughs> after the action. It is fine often to learn things after you have such an issue at home. You cut that onion with a fleshic knife and then with a milchic knife and you want to know its status. It is okay to learn that halacha after you have that onion on your counter. But when it comes to issues of pikuach nefesh, that is something that the rabbi is obligated, sheyedu ha'am kodem ma'aseh, before such events. The people must know, do not ask questions. A beautiful explanation, but one that obligates us to be aware of it. You use common sense, of course. You use common sense. We'll take questions at that. You have to use common sense. But at the same time, hanishal megune, and I am fulfilling my chelek by sharing this information with you now. So you know a nice insight from Rav David Frankel, and next time you hear of his Talmud Ramosha, which most of you know as, he's known more as Moses, Moses Mendelssohn, you'll know as well that he had a great uh, Rebbe and an insight that is Nogea Lamaisa that we have learned from him. Fine, so now we can begin our discussion on Hilchos Shabbos. <coughs> A journey today means getting to the airport. A hundred years ago, a journey meant getting to the port and taking a, a boat, a ship. That was the norm. There is a Gemara in Shabbos that makes the following statement that you should know. Ein mafligin besvina shlosha yomim kodem Shabbos. The Gemara shares with us the following that on the three days leading to Shabbos, you do not board a ship unless it is for a dvar mitzvah. Meaning, on Sunday, on Monday, on Tuesday, you could board a ship without a problem. No problem. When it comes to Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, or according to the Vilna Gon, when it comes to Thursday, Friday, because the Vilna Gon understands this statement, the three days leading to Shabbos, they include Shabbos. If you need to board a ship, let's say on Thursday, and it's not for a mitzvah, and the ship itself will be traveling on Shabbos, it is a problem only for a Dvar mitzvah. This is a statement in the Gemara. What is the issue with it? And this is something we've been discussing between Mincha Mar the past few days. What exactly is the problem of being on a boat on Shabbos? So the Gemara is not clear, but the Rishonim have several explanations. And these are a few things that we have to address to enter into our understanding of the topic. <clears throat> Number one, and this is something that is complex, I will try to keep it short and hopefully will be clear enough. Some commentators explain the issue of traveling by boat on Shabbos has to do with the prohibition of Tchumin, Tchum Shabbat. In other words, if I take residency in some place as Shabbos begins, 
I am not allowed to travel, this is a Gemara, rabbinically, I am not allowed to travel out of my location more than 2,000 amma, which is about a kilometer. Meaning, I am in the wilderness, I am traveling. I stop Shabbos afternoon, I stop and Shabbos begins. If that is my place for Friday night, if that is my place, Ben Ashmoshes, Ben Ashmoshes of Friday night, that becomes my Makom Kavu, and therefore I am not allowed to travel more than 2,000 Amma, a kilometer in any direction. <coughs> now before you get nervous and ask, wait a second, I, I walk more than a kilometer to Shul. So the answer is that your city is considered like your place. Your city is like the, your Dalet Amot. In other words, you could walk your whole city, there's absolutely no problem walking on Shabbos from lakefront to Major Mackenzie. It's considered one city nowadays. It's built up. But if, for example, you are in cottage country, uh, you are in the mountains, and you are in an area that's an isolated bungalow, you have to be familiar with the concept of Tchum Shabbat. Period. Issue. That's piece of information number one. This issue is rabbinic. However, the Jerusalem Talmud is of the opinion that if you travel... 12 mil, which is 12 kilometers about, you actually are dealing with a Torah law. This is the opinion of the Yerushalmi. Fine. Let's make it a little bit more complex. The Talmud asks the following question. If, let's say, theoretically, I could go ahead and travel more than 10 tefachim from the ground. The tefach is about, let's say, three and a half inches. So if, let's say, theoretically, I could float, and I could float more than 35 inches from the ground, is there still an issue of tchum Shabbat? Why would someone think of such a problem? So we know that regarding the laws of Shabbos, I'm not allowed, I am not allowed to transfer in a public domain an object for Amos, about seven feet. But the Gemara tells us that if I take a sticky object, object, and I'm standing in a public domain in Times Square, and I throw the sticky object more than four amot, but it sticks to a wall, and it is on a place that is more than 35 inches from the ground, more than 10 fachim, I have not transported an item from within the public domain, because anything above 10 fachim is considered out of the public domain. It's complex because at the same time, if we carry something, even if you carry something more than 10 Tvachim, it is considered carrying. But this is what the Allah, and this is going back to the issue of Tchum. The question is, are there Tchumin Lamala Masara or not? And it remains a question. Due to the fact that it remains a question, if you travel less than 12 kilometers, there is no problem if you're able to float up to 12 kilometers. If you need to travel by air more than 12 kilometers, there seems to be an issue of Tchum Shabbat. That's what you have to know about Tchum Shabbat. Back to the boat. There were those who, are of the, who were of the opinion that by taking a boat, you are transgressing the prohibition of Tchum. You are traveling on Shabbat more than 12 kilometers. You violate the issue of Tchum Shabbat. So that's what is explained by some. There was a major debate in the middle, towards the end of the 12th century, around uh, 1170, between the Rambam and the Rosh Yeshiva of the Baghdad Yeshiva. Meaning, we know, we always talk about the end of the Gaonic period. And there's a date. I always wonder about being in the Besmedrash on that day. It was a nice su a sunny morning on March 3rd in the year 1038. And someone walked into the base Medrash and Sura Pumpadita, and they clap on the shtender and they say, ladies and gentlemen, the Gaonic period is over, meaning the period ended. With the passing of Rav Haigon, we say it is a new era. Torah has shifted. The center of Torah is no longer in Babylonia, no longer in Iraq. Now you could find great Torah leaders in Spain and in France. The end of the Gaonic period, 1038. But there actually was a little bit of a revival that took place about 130 years later in Babylonia by a great rabbi, charismatic individual. His name was Rabbi Shmuel ben Ali. Rabbi Shmuel ben Ali. He was a Torah scholar. One of the travelers, Rabbi Petachi, a European traveler, who visited 
Baghdad during that period of time noted that this is a man that acts with like, like a royal. He has guards, he has bodyguards. And he gives us a number of students in his yeshiva, 2,000 students in his yeshiva. So this is taking place, there was, he, he was a significant player, this Rabbi Shmuel Bar Eli. It's interesting to note that Rav Ptachia continues that you should know that the Rosh Yeshiva of the Baghdad Yeshiva, Rabbi Petachia, he had only one daughter and no other children. But you should know, she was Bekia, she was extremely knowledgeable. Bekriya Betalmud, she knew the text of Tanakh very well. The daughter knew the Talmud very well. Vehi Melamedet Akriya Lebachurim, she gave a shir. But, don't get nervous. It was through a window, and that's how she would teach the Talmidim were Bachutz Lemata, the Einam Roimotas. Reptachia describes Iraq in the year 1170 something, and we have the Rosh Hashim's daughter uh, giving a shir. Very, very fascinating. But there's an issue between him and the Rambam. Because he takes a stand that <coughs> Jews in Babylonia should not take boats that travel through the Euphrates. <coughs> it is prohibited because they violate the issue of Tchum Shabbat. So he paskin, the Rosh Shiva, the Baghdad Yeshiva, paskin for Babylonian Jewry. And in his opinion, if it's his psak, it is relevant for the whole Jewish world because historically, Babylonia was the center of the Jewish world, and he wanted to keep that tradition alive. So he paskin that it is prohibited to travel on the rivers of Babylonia on Shabbos. And therefore, as a result, you want to travel to the land of Israel, you've got to take the land routes. The Rambam disagreed with him, and the Rambam made it clear to many that he believed that you should, and you are obligated to take the water routes, to take the rivers. So there was a little bit of a controversy between the two. Rabbi Shmuel Bar Eli argued that among his, his concerns that he has, that perhaps when the boat is traveling, it could be it will hit patches that are less than 10 tfachim, than 35 inches from the bottom of the ocean. Okay, now, we know that in reality that doesn't really work. There's even a Gemara. There was a year ago, there was a cruise ship that tried traveling near Italy and try to see if, halakhically speaking, it is possible to take your big cruise ship less than 35 inches from the ground. It's called the Costa Concordia. If you want to see a ship that's Azoi, you can go online and it's still there. It's a tourist distraction. Now, among the Italians, it will be there for 200 years. So it is something that Lemanye do, that people should know that if you travel less than 35, that's what the Rambam argued. The Rambam Paskin, like the Costa Concordia, that it's not doable. So therefore, he says, it is permissible. And he was very strong with his language and his debate with the Rosh Shiva. There was respect, by the way, but this is how uh, halachic authorities have their discussions. And he says that you should know, Ilu asarnu, if we're, if we, this is a Rambam in a tshuva, if we're going to go ahead and prohibit, kol davar shu vaday shu motar, something that is without doubt permissible, Due to some kind of safeki surah, due to some kind of doubt that you have, so you know what's going to be, you know what the result would be? Ha'inu osrim kola mutarot kulam. Everything would be prohibited. In other words, if we're going to take your approach that perhaps there is a patch that is less than 10 tfachim from the ground and we have an issue of tchumin, it's not going to work like that. Judaism doesn't work like that because everything would be prohibited. And therefore he makes it clear that I believe it's an obligation to take the water route because it's already nit parsem, it is well known that people who, who avoid the rivers use the wilderness, and often the pamim rabot yavol yidei sakana, it is dangerous. So your psak is, pu is putting people in a dangerous environment. And therefore he tells them that, by the way, my philosophy is, ra'uy lehatir lechol adam, it is appropriate to go ahead and allow every person to be lenient. If a rabbinic authority, this was the Rambam's view, 
that if the, a rabbinic authority has the ability to claim that something is permissible, he should say it's permissible. Velo and we should not make it difficult. At the same time, the rabbinic authority himself has the right to be machmir al but for the masses, he disagreed with Rabbi Shmuel Bar Eli. So this is a fundamental dispute between the two authorities. But at the same time, we must ask, so why does the Rambam, how does the Rambam understand the Gemara that indicates that you do not take a journey? You don't go ahead and board the ship on a Thursday. What's the issue with it? So the Rambam follows the school, and listen carefully, the issue, and this is, by the way, the Rambam, it is the Rif, Rabbi El Fasi, it is going to be the Rosh, and therefore it is basically the opinion that makes its appearance in Halacha. Why do you not board a ship, reading the Gemara, on a Thursday because of an issue that it will affect your Oneg Shabbat. You will not enjoy your Shabbos. You will be seasick, and if you're going to be seasick, forget about having uh, fulfilling the mitzvah of Oneg Shabbos. So now, on Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, I'm not obligated yet to worry about Shabbos. When it comes to Wednesday, and you know, Wednesday, I mentioned earlier today that when I was in Yeshiva, I turned to one of the Kolo people and I mentioned perhaps I could come for a Shabbos meal to you. And, he, and this was on a Tuesday, and he said to me, you know what, I only discuss my Shabbos after Lechun I said, what? That, that's a little bit late. Lechun that's Friday night. He said, no, no, he means... Wednesday morning in the Shir Shalyom, the last two verses, are Lechun That's when I get in the Shabbos spirit, Wednesday morning. Wednesday, you start your preparation for Shabbos. So therefore, if it's Wednesday, or according to Vilna Gaon, Thursday, I want to go ahead and board a ship, and I know that's going to affect my own next Shabbos. It is something I should avoid, unless it's a Dvar Mitzvah, because if I'm going to go ahead and do an act of kindness for Tzedakah, in such a case, Oseg ba mitzvah, I am involved in a mitzvah by taking the journey, and I am putter, and I don't have to worry right then on the Onik Shabbos issue. Fine? So that's what we have. The issue of Onik Shabbos, by the way, is a very serious, uh, is an important issue. Among the many areas that makes its appearance, the Trumas Hadeshin. We're going to discuss them soon. Rabbi Yisrael Yisrael Lin uh, lived 1390 to 1460 in uh, a suburb of Vienna from the great Geone Ostreich, that's where the great Kehillers of Germany were divided between the Rhineland and Ostreich. And he was asked about uh, reading newspapers, reading newspapers, and he, on Shabbos. What is, what is the halacha? And he noted that you should know, from what I see, Bnei Adam mit angim bekach. That's how they get their own next Shabbos by reading the news. So therefore, vada'i shari, it is 100% permissible. Har b'nei b'nei adam mitavim lekach, they have a desire, it's like an addiction to news. Right, the beginning of the 15th century. And of course, in the Yaivitz, years later, in the 18th century, adds that if you tell person, a person not to follow the news for a day, or not to read the newspaper, tsa'ar limnoa bifrat haragil, because of the person who is accustomed, he wants nafsho shokeka vekosefet. There's a desire, there's an urge, you need the information. They were addicted. He addresses people that were addicted to news. Yes, and everyone now <laughs> no, no. has on the phone <laughs> and checks out to see what's the latest. And uh, that's the, even before Twitter. Onek Shabbos is important. So therefore, notes, note these authorities. You take a boat ride. You're not going to have an Onik Shabbos, so therefore there's an issue. Now, just to sum up one thing, halachic authorities, and we're going back already hundreds of years, have noted that many, many people board ships on Fridays even. In some cases on Shabbos, which could be addressed at some other time. So these halachic authorities wanted to find an explanation where the behavior of the masses does not contradict the Talmud. So different authorities came up with different explanations. So uh, we have, for example, the Meiri. The Meiri who tells us that nowadays the Sapanim, uh, the seamen, Bekiim Harbe, they're more knowledgeable and they know how to avoid seasickness. That's an explanation given. The Ramban, which is more halakhically nogem, more relevant than anything else. The Ramban notes 
that the Talmudic prohibition is spe specifically applies to a boat that the majority of the people on the, on the ship are Jewish. If the majority of people on the ship are not Jewish, there is no issue. And then there is the Ramah, but many of these interesting and fascinating questions <coughs> are ones that are less relevant nowadays, but they could be Nogeya regarding flight. So this is an interesting halachic question. Can a person, I was asked this once, can a person board a flight in Los Angeles on a Friday afternoon flying to Shanghai? Okay. You get on your flight at 3.15 p.m. <coughs> Friday afternoon, Los Angeles. Friday, you land in Shanghai after Shabbos. So you get on the plane before Shabbos. You get off the plane before Shabbos, after Shabbos. What's the status? Is it permissible? So the issue you can ask is, wait a second, what about the Onik Shabbos? The answer is first class. Okay. <laughs> it's going to first class. There is no issue of Onik Shabbos. And he will not lock the doors in the, wa lock the washroom door. No issue there. This is a very fascinating uh, question. A very complex one, as you could imagine, because it is quite similar to the boat. But that's something that is addressed and later when we talk about uh, those issues. One thing, Nogea Lamaisa, when you travel Friday, we all have that awareness and have that buffer zone not to get stuck. Everyone has a story about Friday in an airport. Everyone has some kind of story. And there are issues about getting off the plane. It, there's no doubt that you get off the plane if you land on Shabbos. <coughs> and halakhically speaking, you could walk home. In some situations, like in Memphis, Tennessee, there was once a young man who landed on Shabbos. Unfortunately, he had a long delay from Chicago. He landed on Shabbos. He walked the 14 miles from the airport to East Memphis. Uh, but some Allah authorities told him that you put yourself in a makam sakana because some of the neighborhoods there are ones that are clearly a makam sakana. So this is something that is complex, something to address uh, perhaps in detail. I would like to, uh, to review, to start off with the following. A lot of travel issues in Shabbos relate to hotel rooms. Now, modern day hotel rooms over the past few decades have become quite problematic due to the new type of keys. And what the keys and the locks, how do we deal with it? So you speak to someone like David Wolf, he comes up with these incredible creative ideas of putting duct tape on the door or a string to the handle. And he has devices, he's really an expert on these issues. He's not here, he's busy picking lemons and carrots. He's strong, but uh, those are questions that have to be dealt with. So there are rules. We have to begin with the rules and then we can work down to details. Is it permissible on Shabbos to ask a non-Jew to go ahead and perform a malacha? That's the question. Is it permissible? The answer is that there are two categories of malachas. There are Torah law malachas and there are rabbinic malachas. To ask a non-Jew to perform a malacha, to perform an act that is only rabbinic, that is considered a double rabbinic prohibition because you're not supposed to be asking him, but you're only asking him to do something rabbinic. So that has been labeled by the rabbi as a double rabbinic shvus de shvus, and it is permissible b'makom mitzvah, b'makom tzorech, there is a need. Okay? The perfect example you know, you know, would be if you have a, a situation that you need food Brought. There is no Erev, and you need the Naju to bring something from a different area. Shvus to shvus, the Makom Mitzvah. Now, what about if you need to ask him to violate a Torah law? What if you have to go ahead and ask him to violate a Torah law? So Ramosha tells us that in a situation where there is a great, great need, so then you can ask him even to violate a Torah law. In other words, to get into your room, by the way, using those keys, we're dealing most probably with a halach, with a rabbinic issue, those keys. So if you happen to be in a hotel and you need to get into your room, what you do is you ask the non-Jew to go ahead and open it for you, which uh, perhaps, perhaps could be a little bit complex. But the general rule, which what, what we have to keep in mind, you're dealing with a Torah law. There has to be a strong reason you're dealing with something that's rabbinic, you could ask the non-Jew, even if there's less of a reason. A little bit of cooking, we're going to address one leniency and then move forward uh, to some fascinating issues with travel. Laws of cooking. What are the general rules of cooking? That an object, an item that was cooked once, you cannot violate the prohibition of cooking again. Ain't bishol, 
So therefore, if I have a piece of kugel in my refrigerator, it is impossible to violate the prohibition of cooking when I want to reheat it. However, there is a rabbinic prohibition of performing an act that appears to look like cooking. So therefore, I cannot take my kugel out of the refrigerator on Shabbos morning, the cooked kugel, and put it in the oven that is on. Because even though I am not actually cooking it, but it appears, it looks like you are cooking. So therefore, you warm up your kugel on a location where it doesn't appear to look like you are cooking. It's not mirsi kemevasha. What defines such a place? So therefore, there are so many different opinions. Ramosha Feinstein was of the opinion that if you have an ho a hot plate and it has no settings, it's just one that you just plug in and it reaches a specific temperature and it remains, due to the fact that you cannot adjust the temperature, it is not considered a place where you cook on, and therefore it is permissible to heat on such a device anything that is dry and cooked already. I say dry because with liquids the issues are a little bit different because if I cook a liquid and then it cools down totally, so according to some, you could transgress the prohibition of cooking again. There are those that say that you have to assess case by case. In other words, look at that type of food and ask yourself, do people warm, cook such a, such a food on such an area? You have a blech, right? What is the blech? A sheet metal covering your, covering your stove top. You want to warm up some chicken on it. Do people make chicken on, on a blech, on, on a stove top? People don't. So there are those who say that you could go ahead and analyze it case by case. If all I'm trying to avoid is appearance, so I have to assess how things are cooked if it is usually not cooked there. So warming it doesn't look like cooking. That's the modern day question of the, the warming drawers. Do people cook in warming drawers? Well, it's called a warming drawer. So there are those that say that due to the fact that it is a warming drawer and people don't cook there, so you could take that dry chicken or the dry kugel and put in it. Ramosha would argue that since it has, a, it has settings, you have to be more concerned because anything with settings appears to be like cooking. So these are things that we are familiar with. One leniency that the Bir Allah gives us that could be relevant for travel is as follows. That this prohibition of putting my cooked food in an oven, in an oven itself, is rabbinic. So now, to ask a non-Jew to do it, I am dealing with a shvus dishvus. I'm dealing with a double rabbinic issue. If I am dealing with a double rabbinic issue, the makom tzarach, in case of need, it is indeed permissible. So therefore, in situations I've been asked, uh, people on cruise ships, they have already, it's cooked already. The items are cooked. They want to know about being heated by the non-Jew. If you ask them to heat it, yeshal mi lismo, you can rely on the beer halacha that gives a green light <coughs> to have cooked food, cooked before <coughs> Shabbos, food reheated by the non-Jew, and you don't have to tell them to put it on the knobless no uh, hot plate. You don't have to tell them that. So one piece of information that is Irrelevant, as you can imagine, this is a complex, and there are several issues to address. But we're going to move forward a little bit, a little bit more. Any? Maybe we'll take a question on this specific one, if there is. How do you define need? How do you define need? Okay. One way of defining need is you need hot food for Shabbos. Meaning, the Baal Hamor, you know, the hot, the, the hot issue of the 11th century was <laughs> that people. There were people who did not eat hot food on Shabbos. They believed that you are violating Shabbos by eating hot food. There were the carrots. Among the rabbinic community, they followed a school that said it's a mitzvah. And therefore, the Balamor declared in the 11th century that kol misha eino ohel chamin, anyone that doesn't eat hot food, chayshin an shema hu min. We have to be concerned that perhaps he's a heretic. So therefore, eating hot food on Shabbos would be considered, I mean, if you have no other uh, way of getting a hot dish on Shabbos, that would be considered an, a need. That's something that to assess, and a lot of things are case by case. We'll talk, we'll get, yes? If, if we can warm up food on Shabbos in a different way, meaning that we appear it's a A second blech, meaning... Okay. Because you follow, those who told you follow the school, follow the school, that on a blech itself, it's not enough. It is not enough. Meaning there are knobs there, 
And even if you cover them in Ramosha and others would argue that it is an area that you do cook. And even though that specific food might not be cooked there, but due to the fact it's a makom bisho, you should be makmer. So those who told you there is such a school, and if you've been doing it until now, it's a nice thing to continue. There are, I'm not saying you're, you know, maybe you're stuck, but I know. That's the reality. There are, but you're using a hot plate that has no... Hot plate, no knobs is... Do not, there is no need. In North America, if Ramosha says something, you could go ahead and be confident with it. If you have, and that's what, you know, when you do have a one that with no knobs at all, Ramosha says green light, and therefore halacha is, for us Jews in North America, <coughs> to disrespect to the... In a straw, they have platas and... No, no control. They have no controls. They have that there too, you say. And they, okay, good. Now, uh, in Ishua, we're going to address a little bit more, you know, you come to a hotel, you've been in a hotel on Shabbos. And I'm not talking about a, a hotel when you have a Pesach event where there are hundreds of, of Jews. You happen to be in a hotel on Shabbos, okay? You come into the, you come downstairs, on your way to the shul that you are walking to, and you realize that they just made some freshly brewed coffee on Shabbos. Not instant, right? Not the uh, bediyebet coffee, the chatfila, <laughs> ideal coffee, brewed. And you ask yourself, wait a second, they just made this on Shabbos. Can I drink it or not? <coughs> what? They didn't make it for you. They didn't make it for you? Okay. But they cooked it, and maybe they did have, this is a good question. And it's a question that's very close to my uh, heart, right? Because if the Yavit says there were people that were adukim, that were addicted to news, we'll learn next week that there were people already in the early 18th century that were addicted to coffee. And I come from that Masoras, right? So what would be, what would be the status? So now there's a fascinating discussion in Halacha about bread baked on Shabbos. Not for a Jew, meaning if a non-Jew, there is no question, if a non-Jew, if my neighbor bakes some bread for me, if the baker says, I just baked this for you, I had you in mind, or if someone makes a cup of coffee for me on Shabbos, there is no question it is prohibited. He did it for me, I am not allowed to drink it, period. The question is, if it is a large hotel and they don't know of me, I don't know of them, you happen to pass by and see a cup of uh, freshly brewed coffee, what is the status? So regarding bread, there's a machlokes, the chaya adam, and he is not the only one. Many uh, great rabbinic authorities, the Maharsham, say, if Hanochri, let me read his words, <laughs> if the non-Jew eno yodea klal b'Yisrael shishote teve kafe, it has to be that the non-Jew doesn't know you personally, meaning it is a routine that they have. They wake up in the morning, they go ahead and they brew a whole uh, pitcher of coffee. They don't know you. Mutar lishtot kafe. It is permissible. The Chaye Odom gives us Chaye Odom gives us really life here on Shabbos, and it gives us a green light. But remember, you cannot indicate to him. You can't come in and say, "When's the coffee going to be ready?" And they go run and they do it. And you can't pay for it. The Ramon notes that if you pay for it, even if you walk in, right? You know, someone could take this a step further. I could, I could see myself taking this a step further. I go into a Starbucks on Shabbos. <coughs> And I get a cup of coffee, and I say to them, I'll pay you after Shabbos. Then already it's prohibited. The Ramos says, if you have to pay for it, absolutely not. It is a green light for someone that's staying in the hotel, that these Gdole Yisrael give us a wonderful way of enjoying a freshly brewed cup of, of coffee. Now, now we'll talk about the international dateline. It was a, a, a complex, controversial issue that came to life in 1941. 1941. Jewish people knew about this idea of an international dateline. It must exist. <coughs> if I would have a globe here, I would go ahead and show you that right now, in Eretz Yisrael, they are seven hours ahead of us. In Hawaii, they are about uh, eight hours, seven five, hours. Five. five hours, good, good. Five hours behind us. We're gonna attack Hawaii soon, by the way. <laughs> We're gonna act like the Japanese. So they are five hours behind us. So eventually you get to some point where you have to go ahead and determine that east of that line is uh, Monday and west of that line it is Tuesday. Where is that line? <coughs> so we know in 18-something there was a conference. They go ahead and drew the line. They played with it back and forth. 
Where does the halach, where does halacha place the international date line? So this was a perplexing question that authorities dealt with. And it was in the theoretical realm until 1941, because the few that had to deal with it had their own approach. 1941. As you know, my mother was born in Shanghai. My mother, I love telling people, especially in Toronto, that my mother's Chinese. Why was my mother born in Shanghai? Because her parents, uh, you know, Josh uh, knows the story better than, better than me, but he, my parents, uh, my grandparents, my mother's grandparents <coughs> leave the Tells with the last train in 1940. They arrive, they take the cross Siberia train. The Mir Talmidim, like your, your, your late father, made it to uh, Kobe in, uh, in Japan. But my grandparents made it directly from Vladivostok to the Ganeiden of uh, Shanghai, Nishkeven, a Ganeiden. So for the ones that traveled with the Mir Yeshiva, they come to Kobe in 1941. And they knew that there is some kind of halachic question about where the international date line is. And they make one of the worst mistakes a student can make. They ask one question to two authorities. And they do get two answers. So there was a Rav Tukachinsky, well-respected rabbinic authority. And he says, you want to know where the international date line is? It's very simple. The Medrash tells us that Jerusalem is the center of the world. So what you do is, is you slice planet Earth into two, and 180 degrees from Yerushalayim, east or west, that is where the international date line is. It slices through, uh, through the sea. It is to the east of Hawaii. Okay? But you guys who are in Japan, the Shiloh was sent from Japan, from Kobe, Japan, even though you left uh, the coast of China, even though the status remains, you keep Shabbos on Saturday, and you go ahead and work with that. The sent question was sent as well to Reb Chaim Oyser, and he said, I don't deal with these issues. I, there's a new post which I turn to, and that is the great Chazonish, Rabbi Shai Karelitz of Nebra. And the Chazonish said that people who believe that it's 180 degrees from Islam, it's wrong, because the Rishonim, the Kuzari, and the Balamor already share with us, and they give us the information of where the international date line is. Where do the Rishonim share with us this information? Because there's a Gemara in Rosh Hashanah, Davchof, and the Gemara tells us that you should know, that you could go ahead and make, if let's say the new moon is Rosh Hashanah, you want to go ahead and establish the first day of the year. You know when the new moon is the Mola. So the Gemara tells us that if the Mola is, for example, at 11.55 a.m. in the morning, on a Tuesday, so you can make Rosh Hashanah on that day Tuesday. If on the other hand the Gemara tells us that the Mola, the new moon, the new moon is at 12.05 p.m., 10 <coughs> minutes afterwards, 5 minutes after midday, on a Tuesday, so let's say the Gabbai announces that the Mola, in the traditional Yiddish one, right, the Mola is going to be at 12.05 p.m. on a Tuesday, Rosh Hashanah cannot be on that day. Why? Because if the Mola is after noon, you no longer, the Gemara says, say, you can have a Rosh Hashanah on that day. What's the logic? What is the significance of noon? So the Baal Amor knows, and this is one of the Rishonim, that up until noon, there is somewhere on planet Earth that it is still before Rosh Hashanah. Up until noon in Eretz Yisrael, there is somewhere on planet Earth where it's still yesterday. So if it's still yesterday, there is somewhere where you could sanctify a complete Rosh Hashanah. 12.05, five minutes after noon, Everywhere on planet Earth, it is already today. Indicating, basically, what this statement is saying, that the international dateline is 90 degrees to the east of Yerushalayim. Okay, a quarter of planet Earth. Which places, places it on the coast of China. You cannot, Chazish says, it's impossible to imagine a situation where it's a straight line. So therefore, he argues and he basically... Paskins, that the international date line follows the coastline of China. So you pass the coastline of China, you go in and you travel to Japan, you have crossed the Halachic international date line. So even though everyone says to one another, good Shabbos, you say, no, 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 it's only Friday. And when they say to one another, uh, Sunday, you say, no, 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 it's Shabbos. So he sent this psaq to Japan, 
and it given lebedik. It was not simple there for the Talmudim what to do. So many of them decided not to do. You had two psakim here of Tukuchinsky. You had the Chazanish. So what did they decide to do? To keep Shabbos two days. Doable, by the way, if they were sitting and learning. Let's face it, right? Doable. Until there's something called Yom Kippur that shows up. <laughs> now, let's see if you're a real man, right? Let's see if you're a real man. And now, was this? so they sent the Shaila to Eretz Yisrael and they begged that there's some kind of conference. It didn't happen. It didn't happen. And the Chazonish made it clear and he said to them, you don't have to be machmer like the other opinion. Just follow what I say. <laughs> Worry not. And eat on Wednesday, fast on Thursday. Worry not. It was a very complex issue. There was a group of people actually that out of uh, that were ready in, in, in Shanghai that had a boat out leaving to the United States in October 1941 and they had already their tickets and they were ready to take the journey but they realized that the on Yom Kippur they're going to be in the gray area the Machloika zone they wanted to avoid the Machloika zone so they delayed they didn't take that ship and they waited for the mid-December ship from from Shanghai to the United States. That one got delayed to this, to, due to the war, and they had to wait another five years in Shanghai <coughs> due to this issue. This is a very, very serious issue in halacha. Uh, halacha lemaisa, people do indeed uh, wonder what to do. So where are the areas where there is a question? The areas of where there is a question is Hawaii, New Zealand, okay, in uh, Wellington, right? That's where it lies. New Zealand and Japan, okay? What do you do halach lemaisa, right? So Japan and New Zealand, I think, are more complex. I think with confidence, we're gonna end this plan with confidence, I'll tell you what to do in Hawaii, and you don't have to worry about Hawaii. That in Hawaii, and I'm gonna share with you soon why, you, you, keep, you keep Shabbos on Saturday. Why? Why am I so confident? In other words, I told you that according to Rav Tukachinsky, According to Rav Tukachinsky, the international date line is in between the mainland of the United States and Hawaii. So basically, according to Rav Tukachinsky, you should be keeping Shabbos in Hawaii on Friday. A great rabbinic authority that tells you that Friday is your Shabbos. And I'm telling you that you could follow the Chazanish, and I'll share with you why. This is not myself, I'm not on that level, but great poskim say this for the following reason. The Yaivetz addresses this question as well. And he asks, where's the international date line? Where's the halachic international date line? And the Yaivetz answers, there is no such thing. There is no halachic international date line. He says, well, what, what do you mean? So the Yaivetz says, you know what, there's a Gemara. If a person is traveling and he doesn't know when Shabbos is, count six days, keep the seven. He says, when you're traveling, if let's say someone is traveling to the, to the west, Keep, keep your own, keep your own schedule. Someone is traveling to the east, keep your own schedule. <coughs> when you reach a community that has it differently, meaning if you cross into, so join that community, but up until that point, you don't worry about it. This is what the Yaivet says. So let's up upgrade the statement a little bit more. Let's, let's, I'm gonna go back a thousand years, and I'm gonna be like a Viking, and I'm gonna travel the world. With me so far? I'm in the United States, the Vikings were here in the United States a thousand years ago, and I continue traveling, and I, by the way, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Torah Jew, I'm with the Vikings, and I reach Hawaii. Did, did I cross internationally? Then they had no idea at that point that they are more than 180 degrees from Yerushalayim. They didn't know. It's impossible. They didn't have that information. Up until the modern day, they didn't know. So there's no question, there is no question, that up until about 170, maybe perhaps a little bit more, when they had the ability of determining exactly where they are, up until that point, up until that point, Hawaii had the status of the United States that you did not cross the international date line. On the other hand, on the other hand, Japan and New Zealand is a little bit more complex because the Chazonish argues that the Rishonim actually knew that as soon as you get off the coast of China, you cross the international date line. So someone visited